the, um, the meeting is being recorded visually and audibly, auditorily. Um, and public comment period. Anybody here? No, nope, just sitting here. <laughs> you mean, do we, do we actually want to comment? I mean, you can, there's, there's time throughout this discussion that happens tonight. If you want to say something, you can ask him. Great. Most likely say, say something. We don't think we've ever declined anybody. Um, but if you had anything specific to say up front, um, Sharon. Well, I, I'll no, just don't say feel that I'm here <laughs> as usual, but I'm not getting the um, alerts about the meeting that I always got, which is why I got to, I, I, I saw that um, Adele had emailed you, but I didn't see a response. I guess I wasn't not part of the response, so then I got in touch with Elisa to find out what was happening. And I'm just, I'm part of the Northampton committee that's working on resistance um, for the Columbia Gas Reliability Project. So I'm particularly interested in what you're going to say. We talked about that today. Okay. Okay. I will say that. One of the reasons you may not have gotten notified uh, was when I tried to, I had sent out, I, well, I, I had sent out an original agenda, and then there was an amended agenda. When I tried to send out the amended agenda, uh, the city's website wouldn't let me log in. Well, I didn't so, get either. Okay, so that, that doesn't make sense. Huh. Okay. I will take that and pass it on to see if I can find out why. Thank you. Um, before we move on to reviewing the minutes, I have a sad announcement to say that Scott is his last meeting with us. What? Yeah. <laughs> what do we got? Can I just Yeah, did you submit a letter of resignation or formal letter of resignation? I did, and I didn't hear back. So <laughs> <laughs> waiting on a stay of execution uh, 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 from the mayor. I, I don't remember voting on this. <clears throat> I, I mentioned to Chris that I'll be uh, no longer a resident of Northampton. We're moving one town over. I just innocently thought, almost jokingly, that means I can't be on the commission anymore, right? Well, he said, true. actually, it does. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Well, I mean, yeah. congratulations. But. Because sometimes if someone works in Northampton, they kind of I have session. a home office in Northampton, but my company is not located here. It'd be a strange. You can find a loophole for me. <laughs> <laughs> jump through it. <laughs> Walk a move. Yeah. Well, there's, that's, a, that's a big loophole. Think of, think of a mortgage, you'll say. Uh, <laughs> can you buy a farm in Northampton? <laughs> a parklet. Wayne is so yeah, I was going to say. Can buy a parklet. Zero lot <laughs> and a mini house. A mini house <laughs> or a micro house. <laughs> yeah. and this is important. You have to do all this just to stay on the commission. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, but um, I, I reluctantly um, sent David a note this week, and, um, and more reluctantly um, will be uh, sad to, to not be involved in this commission. It's been nothing but a pleasure working with this group. It's such a, so, so many good and rich topics we work on, and uh, so many great perspectives I get to hear. And, uh, I, I'm hoping it won't be the last you've heard of me. I'm, I'm considering starting an energy consulting practice in the near future, so I'll, uh, I'll be uh, passing out business cards in the future. You can come to public comment to every. every <laughs> Just what he wants to do. You. Yes. And Chris tells me that there are a number of people that uh, might be able to occupy the seat, and um, if, if you want more ideas, Give you some more too. Sure. If you have ideas, why not? Okay. I mean, it just means they would have to put an application into the mayor's office. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. right. he'll make the ultimate decision. Right. Okay. Well, if, if I can say that, your, your contribution has been invaluable and you, you've actually had a profound influence on how this committee conducts its polity. So you will be sorely missed. Thank this you. isn't just a, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah, we, we'll see what we can do to bend the rules or something, but I don't know. Okay. But, but yeah, you you, uh, you 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 give us certain gravitas that we didn't know, wouldn't otherwise have. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yes. Haven't you heard that word used in association with me? <laughs> well, well, I'll write Coming it down. From you, I'll, put, I'll put it right. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, your influence will live on in the agenda that goes out every time. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Status report decision needs action needed. <laughs> oh, that's just a pet peeve of mine. Oh, I I know. <laughs> what are we trying to do here? It, right. Before it you start us, an agenda item, what's the outcome? Right, it keeps us clear. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right. Okay, well, Scott, you will miss your input for sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes from so the July moved. meeting. Second. And actually seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Right. All the way around, Louis. I can't remember if I was at the meeting or not. I did read it. Okay. Well, you you want to approve the abstain or you're still allowed yeah. to approve. You're still allowed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. sure. No okay. one's going to tase you. I did. I did read. <laughs> Make the minutes easy then. <laughs> okay. Um. Ah, are you with CT? No. No, I'm with that same group that Sharon's with. Okay. Unfortunately, we have a presentation from the Center for Ecotechnology, and they are not here. Mm. Let me give you a real brief update on it, and if they don't make it tonight, I'll have them back. They are starting a program right now where they are um, <coughs> uh, aimed at um, people who earn, I think it's 60 to 80 percent of the median income, so it's a, you're, you're not your low income, but your lower income, and they are trying to sell packages of, of photovoltaics and heat source, air source heat pumps, packaged together. They have a small incentive they're adding to it, um, uh, and they're marketing it throughout the whole western Massachusetts area. So they would give you a lot more detail. When I heard about it, I, I was actually quite thrilled to hear what they're doing. So I thought it was a great opportunity for them to tell you guys about it. And maybe they will show up and we'll have them later on. The Probably stuck in traffic. Yeah, right. Stuck, stuck behind a storm cloud or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, hopefully it'll show up. Um, uh, uh, okay, and then, Elisa, I'm going to hand this one off to you. I'm going to hand it off to Bill. And Bill. Oh, okay. wow, that's Bill. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what you have before you in one of your documents that Chris sent is, the, is actually the draft. It is a, the, the, roughly the final draft. Of a resolution that, in essence, I'll, I'll break it down so I'll spare you all the words, and then you, we can read the words because we want some contributions if you had some. But as as you understand, as, as you know, that Columbia Gas is interested in expanding in order to um, putatively accommodate uh, uh, natural gas demand, and part of the concern for us is the fact that with their imposed moratorium there was um, it actually compelled us to as we know become a little more conscientious about how we uh, move away from fossil fuels which was our also our objective it kind of dovetailed nicely with that and suddenly we've been do and actually Wayne's presentation is going to jive nicely with this but the fact is that we we the concern is, is that we feel that Columbia Gas is using Northampton, for one, as a reason for this expansion, explaining that, that our demand is what is driving this. And we're saying, in fact, we've reduced our demand by, by living under this moratorium and also aggressive programming and, and a commitment to 100% renewables and moving towards that goal. And we don't like being used as the example or the reason by which they they propose to create this uh, this pipeline spur. So, in essence, this resolution is saying that we do not support the pipeline expansion. That we are, and then we're reiterating our commitment to uh, eliminating uh, fossil fuels. But also embedded in this is the acknowledging and recognizing the fact that there are circumstances in which natural gas and, you know, uh, I think Wayne introduced the Vernon Street um, school as a good example that we would improve, I mean, the fact that we have antique oil burners there and there's not a lot of options for them for retrofits that would necessarily work for them, whereas natural gas may work for them. Those circumstances seem appropriate, but um, and then I believe the lumber yard is currently it's committed to propane, right? And British fuel and natural gas. Yeah. So, I mean, there are projects here that actually 
would benefit, but the, um, it's our belief that, that that's not actually uh, a tipping point in order to qualify, at least to promote the continued expansion or the reduced demand by one, addressing the, the leaks, the leak issue, and then also the fact that demand is diminishing as opposed to expanding. So that's the essence of the resolution. The hope was is that this committee would kick it around, agree with us, critique us, tell it disabuse us of the delusions, whatever. So that's our hope. This is a reasonable summation. Okay. I guess I would just add one quick thing, which is uh, that Bill touched on at the end is the, the um, piece around fixing the leaks. Um, we, the city council two years ago, um, and I think the, the uh, sustainability commission signed on to it then too, did our first piece on, pipe, on the pipeline when the uh, pipeline was proposed um, to go under the Connecticut River and not, not actually come through Northampton or affect Northampton, but um, we, we did a resolution at that point and we brought forward research that um, two, P, two major studies that have been done in the last few years that show that if, um, if in fact Columbia Gas fixed all leaks big and small, um, there would be adequate supply of gas for the area. And we focused on that in that particular resolution and we return to it here. Thanks to this, the folks from this group, um, there was quite a bit of pressure on Columbia Gas and they did fix a bunch of identified leaks, but there are many more and many more large ones still to be fixed. And um, we, uh, I mean, I believe from the research that in fact, if they continued on that path, we would have an adequate supply of gas. So um, that's embedded in resolution as well that piece of it. And one other concern of course is that with the momentum that we're having with uh, alternatives that that would be dampened by the prospect of being able to um, have additional and growing expanded gas access um, and that would kind of dampen um, the energy no pun intended that's already invested in this uh, uh, moving towards 100% renewables to suddenly re-embrace a fossil fuel would well, be hypocritical at, at best and, and be really detrimental to the process at worst. So. Yeah, so does everybody have a chance to read the full resolution? Okay. In that case, I'd say you know, we need to read it out loud here. Right, we'll spare you that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Other comments? I mean, I will say, Bill, your example of Florence, um, uh, the Vernon Street, the Vernon Street School. As, as I recall, when that was brought up as an example of one place where you might need it, we had a commission member who said, "No, near source heat pump should be able to cover that as well." So that was no, that was and Chris, I take issue. That's not what he said. He said air source heat pumps wouldn't cover the. Like oh, he did. That's real yeah. clear. Yeah, I just stand corrected. Okay. You know, and I, I mean, I guess I, I renew the, the comments that I've made several times is that it's it's um, it's expensive, and we're putting the foot we're, we're working towards an expensive way, and and it it does limit people um, in, in terms of upgrading. I mean, right now you can't put an on-demand water heater in your house if you have already have other you know other gas the meters aren't big enough to cope with the short-term demand and that's part of what all the all the uh, a lot of the gas if more efficient gas units have a really high short-term demand um, and but in the end they're, they'll use 25 percent less but when they need it they need a lot of it. <coughs> And we're doing this balancing back and forth about how many BTUs is a stove, how many BTUs is a water heater, how many BTUs is a furnace, and can you fit all that into your 220 thousand um, BTU um, meter, which they won't change. I don't know if it would. Um, I don't know how much 
increase demand, we would see it doesn't, there's nothing about having a bigger gas line that keeps people from putting solar on their roof. Um, and then the one point that I think I, that I made before is that all this new high-tech gas stuff that's very efficient is not going to last forever. It's a 10 or 15 or 20 year investment. And so there is, there is another bite of the apple not very far down the road. But ultimately, right now, it's the very cheapest way. Well, anecdotally, actually, I just did a conversion. <clears throat> I, I actually had gas, but and we have on demand hot water. We got rid of oil and we did the upgrade. So in, I, my existing gas service for my stove actually did accommodate all the retrofits. Um, and then now, and now I'm supplementing with uh, air source heat pumps as well. Um, so I didn't need another meter head that didn't need to make an appeal for any adjustments in that. So, but I, you know, I said anecdotally, that's me. I don't know, but I, I was in an antique, poorly insulated balloon structure house. So, um, uh, so the additional, I mean, the retrofits have been going on, right? I mean, I know that. Well, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 sit, I sit and see how many on demand water heaters can't be. I mean, that's basically the ones I hear about. And, you know, because the gas inspector has a calculator. And, uh, I mean, Carolyn Mish ran up against that. And she was um, 10,000 BTUs short of, uh, of being able to put an on demand water heater. And so she went back to the tank type. It was more, of course, more more efficient tank type water heater. So um, we're going on to the air source water heater, but they're like three thousand dollars. Right. I mean, they're they're very expensive. We're getting super technical here, and that's important. But we also have in one of our resolutions here, um, we, we talk about um, as it completes pipeline repair. Um, Columbia Gas should consider a selective lifting of the moratorium as necessary for gas needs that cannot as yet be safely or adequately met by alternatives. So we did kind of take into account this idea that there, you know, if there are needs that can't be met in other ways, that they will they should consider lifting the moratorium. So hopefully that kind of covers some of the, the kinds of issues that you're addressing. But that's that's been my concern on this was there will be they will have to be the arbiters the city's not going to be the arbiters as who qualifies and doesn't qualify for uh, gas fit and and I don't know policy wise if that's something that they'd even be inclined to consider to basically selectively determine what's the appropriate application um, so I can see customers getting pretty ticked off if their neighbor gets it they don't qualify so. You know, one thing, it's, it, it is pretty technical, but the, one of the ways to know that, that, that Columbia Gas isn't making up the lack of capacity is that there's a propane facility at the corner of Earl Street and Route 5 and um, Route 10. And when the gas pressure drops below a certain point, they put propane, they mix propane in with the natural gas because it has more BTUs, and that's what keeps that. When they have, when the pressure drops, they do that, and they have to do it to keep the to keep gas functioning. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that the fact they're still using it is a good indication that they're that it's not truly made. They're still even with the the reduced demand, which, and you know that that there is a reduced demand because there are nobody's adding gas. People are getting rid of it. They're still up against that limit, mm. you know. And I'm not, I'm not like arguing for the Keystone Pipeline by any stretch. I think this is a, a fairly, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a fairly, fairly narrow, um, focused piece. I mean, you know, do um, you know whether or not if someone reduces their bit of load, so they put in a higher efficiency system of some kind, or they switch over to air source as well? Um, they're, I mean, their bill, uh, the way they're, uh, they're charged, they're, they're tagged with having a certain capacity that mm -hmm. Columbia Gas has to keep for them. Right. But if they're no longer using anywhere near that capacity, do you know if that capacity that's allocated drops? 
I, I, it's interesting. I've asked Columbia Gas any number of times, and I can't get that information. Right. The only the, the empirical piece that I got to is that when that plant on Earl Street is pumping propane into the system, it's because the pressure dropped below a threshold. And yet, I, I would also ask, how long has that been used? Was that used before the moratorium? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that might be just an ongoing uh, aspect if they, of it. It's expensive. If they didn't have to do it, they wouldn't do it. It's, okay. it's right. expensive. It costs, costs more, a lot more to maintain the plant and, use, and add propane than it does to leave it out. This, no, but I, I would ask if that was part of something before you, before you even got to the moratorium. It is basically that's their peaking plant. You know, as electricity has peaking plants, right. is that their peaking plant that they know they're going to need? Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's regardless of whether they have a moratorium or not, right. that peaking plant might be a necessary piece. It, it may, but, and like, but at what point it, and how much do they have to use it? And, you know, I mean, it would be, I think it'd be really valuable incredibly useful to be able to look at the amount the demand both in terms of total total amount used and then and then peak demands in Northampton and I know they know it just and the electric company is much more forthright I think with their numbers but um, no. but <laughs> Columbia Gas you know period end of state well yeah Columbia Gas has actually provided me with annual gas use in by North, in Northampton, in Northampton. Um, and they've even broken it down the zip code and by, um, by um, account type. They, they haven't clearly given me an idea of what, they, they've given me kind of. Over, over a period of time? Yeah, over a year. Yeah, but it doesn't include peak. It doesn't tell me peak. Uh, it does tell me the total amounts. Yeah, so I, they mean, were, I, I really want to see it. They did, you know, yeah. it started in 15. And what I was asking for it was 12. And, and they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't give me the 12, 13. Um, but that that would be a really uh, if, and I I'd argue that if we are saving use, if we're cutting our use back, we ought to be able to get what we're not using uh, for for more Offset. for more efficient equipment. Smith College is changing just about every gas boiler on the campus for a more efficient gas boiler so that they can get the capacity um, to run their new library. Yes. Oh, so they're doing they're, an offset to do the They're line. doing an offset. Mm -hmm. It's real clear, you know, specific, made a deal with Columbia. I think we, we have to, at a certain point, though, we have to be responsible for encouraging a sea change. And if we continue to rely <coughs> on gas and we expand capacity, people will utilize it. But the, I mean, one of the, the indicators that I think is really interesting is downtown, we have a few new um, restaurants and a brew pub and other things going in, despite the fact that they're not able to access gas and they're finding alternatives and they're making use of the incentives to use alternative sources. And so that to me feels like a kind of model of how we encourage that sea change, and we encourage people to think in different ways, and we provide the incentives so that they can, the financial incentives. So this, to me, feels like another piece, this resolution, and you know, having the city kind of make statements like this feels to me like it's, you know, we have to be responsible for that tipping point. So I, I get what you're saying, Louie, and I think we have examples in the city of ways in which people are finding alternatives I mean, they I mean, have to. A new group pub that has a 400,000 BTU oil-fired hot water meter. Or the, the um, dry cleaners that, that put in 120,000 BTU hot water meter. oil fire. You know, I mean, that's for, for, for large, or, you know, the 1,000-gallon propane tank that's going into the new apartments. It isn't, it isn't it isn't across the board, and it's not like we're just just because you can't get more gas doesn't mean you're going to, you're not going to use fossil fuel. Um, they did, you know, the Pleasant Street um, 150 to 155 did did go with all air source pumps. Um, the the uh, lumberyard is going with air source heat pumps for heat and and propane for hot water. 
he couldn't figure out a system um, with their source heat pumps for hot water. It's not, it's not that we're not doing it, but we can't let ourselves think that everybody's, because they can't get gas, they're not going to use fossil fuels. Well, you said the new medical marijuana growing facility that's going to be between 300,000 and 500,000 square feet. So haven't it's something. Seen, haven't, haven't heard about it. So they're trying to get gas. I'm not sure if they're going to get it. But it, if they couldn't get gas, what are they like? Because they're going to suddenly be oil. I mean, I mean I mean, you ask what they're likely to do, they're likely to do oil because it's it's the cost of the equipment. Yeah. And, and you know, the ground source is great, but it's really expensive. And they're going to be one of our biggest consumer fuel mm. I don't think that, I, I, they're, I don't, they're going to probably end up even, I don't know if they could get gas out there. Is there, I don't know. There's a gas pipeline there, and I have no idea this capacity. I have no idea they can use it, but there's a pipeline that they were negotiating. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how to work with that, right? I mean, it's, it's, I, I, what I see is the cost of, you know, the equipment and, and, um, how, 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 who can afford to, to, to go step up to a, to a ground source, uh, you know, Who can afford? Who can afford? And a lot of new houses are getting it, and a lot of um, you know a lot of high end um, renovations are using it. But um, it's an awfully expensive way to change out a thirty gallon water heater, and people can't. And people just can't seem to afford it. I mean, it's it's a high, an expensive initial expensive way, and long term, I don't know what the payback. Time is, but I bet you it's you know if you're looking at if you're looking at life cycle costs, it's probably quite comparable with um, with a you know air source heat pump or, or gas or gas well, oil or some kind. There's also the option yeah, of going so straight electric sure. resistance with solar assist if you want a really cheap upfront system. The solar incentives are so good now, the payback is so good. You can put a resistance water heater in, or even resistance heating. And put a lot of solar on to offset it. To your point, Chris, on storage, I've heard it said that that Columbia Gas and other gas utilities, for that matter, could get the capacity they need with storage, not propane storage, but just natural gas storage. And, yeah. You know, compressed air, compressed gas right. pumping station. Mm -hmm. Certainly, demand situation. Right. I mean, they're not looking for a pipeline to carry the total volume. Right. They want it to carry the short-term volume at at a given moment. Right. But I think, yeah, I think they've done that before. Liquid, liquid natural gas. They've got right. there's there's some stations around. Um, I think they're, they're expensive to build, but not as expensive as a pipeline. And they don't encourage more use of fuel. They're just right. 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 So I would hope that this resolution encourages that as an alternative to a moratorium if they need capacity. I've seen that case made before, and I. I don't know the economics, but they may not be willing to take that alternative, even if it's economically equivalent, because it doesn't get them any more revenue. And we should be disincenting that. It came about that thing about looking for sites, and then didn't do it. So I'm not sure, I don't know if it's an economic argument. right here. Look, <laughs> <laughs> the old, the old cast. Yeah. Well, I would second what you said, at least I think that um, we need to be making a commitment as a society that we not fossil fuels and we need to make it harder for people to use fossil fuels and during this short term interim period when it is more expensive to use renewables we need to come up with ways to make those renewables accessible to, to everyone people who can't afford it um, so you know maybe as a committee or as a city we need to be thinking about how we put in place financial incentives but i completely endorse this resolution i mean second word in it is that we're in climate emergency and i appreciated that language in our conversation at the last meeting um and given that that's the case i i just don't know how in good conscience we could you know allow the gas I have 
uh, put in a couple more, be it further resolved, this may be interesting some of this. One was uh, be it further resolved in Northampton request that Columbia Gas provide up-to-date consumption numbers for the cities, for the city covering the years of 2012 to 2017. Uh, be it further resolved that Columbia Gas consider LNG storage as an alternative to the pipeline expansion. I would add consumption, uh, peak demand to the consumption phrase. Peak demand? Yeah, consumption and peak demand. They might not have it or be willing to share it, but that would really tell the story. Because it really is a two or three time event that we're talking about here in those rare below zero days in the winter. You know, I would, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not arguing against, uh, for using more gas. It's, to me, it's, it's a, sh it's a sh much narrower uh, discussion about what happens when you can't get more gas. And they could be totally manipulated. And we could be, no, we could be and completely being manipulated. And, and, the, and the reason that people aren't able to put in, you know, high versus water heaters is because they want their pipeline and they're, and they're not going to fess mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. Which is why we also call for transparency okay. in that document. Was, <laughs> and Louis, I very much appreciate your pushback, actually. I mean, I, when everyone gets all kumbaya on these things, I feel really nervous. And I, you know, because I feel like I'm in. The, the prospect of me being dead right is next to impossible. So, actually, that helps. And it helps also for the case. I mean, to, to anticipate what some of the pushback would be, or some of the explanation, I mean, to make an adjustment for this, because the, the gist of this is to reinforce the fact that we are moving, we are committed and devoted to the progress of 100% renewables, and we feel that this actually serves as kind of an implicit threat to that progress. And, um, you know, and as in the case of most resolutions, this is, is at least is, this is essentially us expressing our hope and desire that we actually aren't mandating anything because we can't. But, and I think your points are very, they're cogent and correct. So, but, but you know, I mean, particular concern is the impact on people who can least afford it. And, um, you know, constantly we talk about how important it is to maintain affordability within the community. And sometimes uh, our best intentions run counter to that. And I, I, I'm really grateful for the fact that you point that out, that we, we are definitely favoring in many cases um, with some alternatives, and I think that's absolutely right. We have to list and catalog the alternatives and make them accessible to, to people who might not otherwise be able to afford them. I mean, there's there's two sides to this. It's one we can say what we want, and at the same time, we have to facilitate that, but particularly among people who don't know or don't have access to making the adjustments. So. Thank you. So was that bill as stated? I'm going to ask if we're ready to, if, if someone's ready to make a motion. But the idea of the, the least of, you know, the people who can least afford it, the low income weatherization programs also do support air source heat pumps. Um, so, you know, the least affordable one actually are, are very well supported if you can wait in line long enough. You know, they don't have enough right. money, but they, they, they do cover, they do cover the least, um, uh, the lowest incomes are covered very well uh, once you get in, in, in line. Well, it's um, the modern income people who are, there, and are that's, really stuck. I believe we have some, okay, <laughs> yeah. so you take a presentation on some people who are going to try to help out okay. there. Um, uh, but I'm just going to, so just mention those two things, and I'm just going to ask, is, it, is the commission, just because of a full agenda, yeah. is the commission ready to move forward with the motion on this? Can I ask a question, I guess? Sure. Do, does anybody have the modeling? I mean, my biggest concern about this is do we send more people to heat oil? Do we have any models of you know, speculating who goes towards heat pumps versus who goes to, to oil? Because that would be, I mean, not that we get to decide. Right, no, the no, same no, argument, right. if we could decide, right. I'd be in favor of this if that wasn't true, but I would be opposed to a greater of having greater greenhouse gas emissions. I just don't know the facts. I would. So yeah. I, would, I would say just from running the Heat Smart program, uh, and the analysis that was done, uh, it's pretty pretty solid that uh, an air source heat pump is going to be less expensive uh, to own and operate 
than the uh, oil oil fired fire boiler. For a home, for and, home. and the focus for, on for residential people, people right? whether it's yeah. a brewery so and, and, and marijuana. Examples place. that we heard that oil uh, oil burners were big were, were big big buildings of some kind. So in a way, that's where your resolution piece is. You know, whereas is that that you you free up room for those situations. Where that's you know that's that's that should become the priority. Where it's really the only um, that's where you have to use it, and you know, that's where you, can, you know an alternative renewable energy alternative is not possible. Then um, then we would want to direct people towards gas if they could use that. But uh, so I, so Dwayne, it seems like they were making a decision that oil was more cost effective. For a large commercial enterprise of some kind, but I, I don't under know a moratorium, under normal circumstances, it wouldn't. Do no, they would have done gas. Right, right. But what we're thinking, and so it may be that in those cases, I mean, I, I without running the numbers, I truly believe that a ground source heat pump of some kind, you know, over a life cycle cost, is probably going to be comparable to oil. Oil is pretty expensive, you know, and it might go up at any time. Oil and high be, maintenance too. And high maintenance, right? So. Um, you know, people are looking at short-term costs and not long-term life cycle costs. Um, and I think, actually, your point, you know, how do we start looking at those cases, bringing them to the attention of the states, where we can, and say, how do we start to help these people make the right decision? These, but, but aren't we kind of starting to make that decision for a smaller number of people? If most people are starting, you know, residential are starting to do air source heat pumps, if that makes economic sense, then why not? We've had, you know, some big apartment complexes make that decision. You know, I think individuals are going to do as well. But, they, have but, second, I mean, they have a second marijuana one because it's so big. But yeah. their one maybe it's from a load maybe the equivalent of two hundred and fifty homes. Um, which is five years has of production. And they just need so, this for space heat? Space heat, right? Yeah. Yeah, lighting they're going to do from electricity and hopefully it's going to be. Yeah, and they're they're going to be positioned down somewhere near the um, uh, the senior center down on Con Street. No, at the first road. Road. This is for growth as opposed to sell. Yeah. The sell the sellers don't need a lot of money. They're no more yeah. right. The people don't care if it's cold or not. It's, yeah. And I'm trying to build this around one facility. And that's just, that's the part of sort of trying to understand the numbers and what the real impact is. <laughs> Again, I want to say I appreciate this conversation and at the same time, kind of the bottom lines of this resolution are demanding transparency of Columbia Gas, demanding that they fix those leaks, um, saying that we would like them to selectively lift the moratorium and that we will continue to create policy and practice um, to encourage renewables. So that's those are the things we're saying, Those and that's things. that's what we're talking about here with the resolution. And you know, I get the questions. You know, are we going to drive big businesses to use oil and all of that? Perhaps, but that's not. It's almost irrelevant to what we're trying to say with this resolution. So I just would encourage us to focus on what we're trying to do here with this resolution. So you, uh, it's been amended. It's got two amendments, so if you're voting on it, it's... it's well, no one's, no one's moved the motion. No, that's what I'm just saying. So I, I will, uh, as the authors, I feel a little squeamish about advancing the motion, so if somebody else advances the motion. What you're seeking is endorsement, support? Endorsement from this committee as we go forward to... Or, of course, co-sponsoring would be great if, if the committee wants to co-sponsor. If, if not, just endorsement. So is anybody ready to put a motion forward? I would put forth a motion to do both co-sponsor and endorse. I don't I have the right words. It's listed in the co-sponsor right, yeah. endorse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for saving the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so co-sponsor, the, the, the um, resolution as amended. And actually seconded. Okay. Um, uh, any further discussion, or I'm just going to say that uh, all all in favor? 
We have five in favor. And two, uh, and any opposed? Any abstain? Two abstentions. I just say that because I you know, totally agree with the four things that you said. I totally agree with the concept. Is, you know, my concern is because we're also saying more. Right. Okay, so, um, so it passes. Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Wayne, how much do you need more than any? <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> we always hope it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think as much or as little time as people have. So if you wanted to see you first, and see yeah, time let's do them first. I'm just wondering how much to hold them to. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, is it Megan? Morgan. Morgan. I'm sorry. I just remembered. Morgan. Okay. You're um, on. This is Angel. And I gave you guys a brief, I, I gave the commission a brief uh, um, introduction of what you guys are going to present, but take it from the beginning there. Fantastic. So, um, I represent the Center for Eco Technology. Uh, where you, you can pass out some information about the Solar Access Program um, located in Florence. And Solar Access it is a state-sponsored program for the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center and the Department of Energy Resources. The um, point of the program is to provide access to solar panel PV as well as air source heat pumps um, for middle-income households. We are doing households up to 120% state median income um, as of this Monday. Uh, we're working out the details. We're definitely doing, we, we have the framework for up to 80% safety income and are adding the 80% to 120% safety income, which receive a different tier of incentives from the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Um, so, as part of the program, we're only doing 100 homes uh, with a big focus on Western Massachusetts. And, you know, the point is to provide the air source heat pumps that would be powered by the solar panels, um, depending on whether we have more solar panels to assist with electricity aside from the heat pumps, or just the heat pumps themselves is up to each individual household. Uh, really, the only constraint that we have through the program is that it is financially feasible for the household. So the way we make it accessible is that there's no money down for any of the equipment. Um, there is low interest deferred financing provided by UMass 5 with a standard 10 year payback period. And the amount that you save on your energy bills monthly will be more than the monthly payment to UMass 5. So it will be cash positive for people who sign up. Um, and that pretty much <laughs> covers the program. There's we ask people to get a home energy audit before, as part of the process, so that we are addressing, you know, insulation concerns, air sealing concerns, because the heat pumps do work better in more tight houses. And that we've had some success with some project already. We have some projects that, that have signed contracts going into the stage of putting on panels. Uh, we've only been doing it since April, and we look to do it for about a year's time, so ending in April of 2019, um, depending on funding for the various pro programs involved. Um, we do make use of the Mass Savings zero percent interest heat loan for the heat pumps, uh, a number of rebates from the Mass CEC. We use the Mass Solar loan for the panels. Um, and our role in this is to combine all of these incentives and rebates into just a package. Uh, we have energy coaches on staff that help guide people through the process and just Make, sh make it so that the only thing they have to worry about is this one monthly payment and the receipts for the SRACs or the SMART incentives when we get there. And um, just really try to make it as accessible as possible for people. And we have our own additional incentive of the first six months of loan payments are covered by our program. That is also true, thank you. And so you're not paying anything while the channels are still coming up online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, what, 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 uh, what is currently median uh, income? It for? depends on the size of the household. So um, I know that 80% for a household size of one is about 38,000. 80% senior income for a household size of four is about 
80 something. Uh, uh, sort of 82 or something. Like that. Yeah. So, um, what kind of outreach have you guys done <clears throat> besides coming and talking to us? But um, we talked to the city of Pittsfield. We, I mean, I went to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, not too long ago and saw Wayne there. Um, uh, I've gone to green drinks events at Williamstown. So we are reaching out to a number of nonprofits as well, the North and Berkshire Community Coalition, just trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. Um, we've done some direct mail with the water utility for Lee. They sent out some information of ours along with the water bill, which was very helpful because I think the biggest barrier to entry is we talk about solar. There are a lot of predatory solar companies out there. and. You know, we are state funded. I'm not a solar installer. That's <laughs> what I tell people. It's really trying to connect people with this pilot program that is, uh, you know, what what is offered by the state and the federal government at this point. So. And, and you, do you guys vet contractors, installers, solar installers? When do they? We have partnered with uh, both an air source heat pump installer and a solar installer. It's Sunbug and Gerard Heating and Cooling. Yeah. Uh, they're both based out of Westfield. Okay. And Sunbug is employee owned. Um, they're both vetted by Mass CEC for because you need to be a participating contractor in order to utilize the rebates through Mass CEC and they're both on the solar and heat pump list respectively. Um, Sunbug is employee owned and we've had nothing but good experiences with them thus far. Some Sunbug put the array on the Rec recreation center. Oh well, look at that. Yeah. So it sounds like the pairing of solar with the mechanical equipment is what makes this a sustainable solution. But did I hear you say that you don't have to do solar in conjunction with the heat pumps? Um, I, if I had said that, it was mistaken. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, so it is because we are a pilot program, we're trying to see if this theory works in practice. So it is a combination of solar panels and heat pumps. I think what I was saying is that we, have, we could put just the number of solar panels to make the heat pump array be net zero, but we could also put additional solar panels to assist with gotcha. the existing electric bills if that makes it more financially accessible. That's cool to hear. One other question. Um, can a homeowner who does not currently have air conditioning put in this system? I'm a little worried that there's a bit of a snapback to the summer season. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the summertime, you're producing the most solar PV, yeah. so it the finances do work even if you don't already have an air conditioning system. Yeah, but um, there's more energy used. Yes, of course, but, <laughs> but it's uh, covered solar by the solar system, panel. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it is, we do have comprehensive financial tools that we use to base on residents' previous electric and heating fuel usage, whether it be natural gas, oil, um, et cetera, that creates a model of how much we'd be able to save in the long term. So um, it's vetted by a former NASA employee and some other workers, so. It is rocket science. It, 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 it is a form of rocket scientist, yeah. Um, but taking a look at it, it definitely looks like rocket science. So I, uh, so far they've, you know, seems like it's been accurate so far. Toward, towards Bill's uh, uh, comment or sure. question on, on uh, uh, what kind of outreach you've done, mm -hmm. how do you get the word out to Northampton? And maybe, I'll ask, specifically. maybe I'll ask that as both a commission as well. And even people in the audience. How do you get the word out to the North Hand on this program? So we have lawn signs. <laughs> we you have do some, have lawn signs. We do have we lawn got signs. yesterday after a phone call. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, we have some keep, uh, keep up employees and other people who have begun the process of going through the program have their solar access signs up. We, Northampton specifically, I couldn't tell you, sir, but we have a website. We do Facebook advertising. Um, Center for Ecotechnology Technology is involved with a number of programs, including energy audits, um, not in this area, but for, for commercial we are involved in this area. We have a solar hot water program going as well, and we try to just get the word out to people about our other varying programs as we're you know, trying you, to make the world greener. Are you connecting, I'm just thinking back to the SolarEyes and Heat Smart programs that we ran, are you connecting with any local volunteers to help do outreach in any communities? We have not. No. Actually, no. Currently, it's all internal. I mean, is it something you would be open to? Yeah, we have a lot of flying monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> they, and it works. Can, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we, we were very aggressive in solar, mm -hmm. and also and also the commingling with uh, 
air source heat pumps. Mm -hmm. So there's there's all the ground is softened here. Okay. What kind of you can't guarantee anything, of course, it's there for our volunteers. I was wondering if something that you guys would be open to. I personally would be very interested in furthering that discussion. I, I mean, the biggest thing is because it is. We, we have to make the financials work in every specific situation and there are some financial constraints as to who can participate in the program. We can use all the help we can get finding the right people. Right. And one other element of Solarize that seemed to work really well was there were thresholds of participation mm -hmm. at which the cost per system went down. So okay. if you did 100, it was one rate. If you did 200, and that created a kind of a bandwagon effect that really worked well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, because we are targeting such a large area at this point, that's that's something that I can definitely bring up for discussion. But it's, you've already got the economy of scale. I, I'm not even sure. Mm -hmm. it, it's just the fact that it is technically the entire state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We're only doing 100 projects. Um, you know, if we could do 20 projects in the area, I'd, I'd be amenable to having a discussion about that yeah. with the appropriate parties. Great. Yes. Um, I was really interested you said something about having energy coaches. Yeah. Um, I participated in my household participated in the, um, and I haven't talked to you about this yet, Chris, in the um, heat smart program to put in a, um, a air source heat pump. And it was so complicated. There were so many steps to it. There were so many forms to fill out. Mm -hmm. Working with UMass Five, they're great, but it was so complicated, and we actually went had to go back there three times mm -hmm. to you know complete the loan mm -hmm. process. It took up a lot of time. It took up a lot of energy. It took up a lot of kind of just you know thinking mm -hmm. how to do it. I put in so many calls to the installer. It could. I mean, the, really the only reason that I, I followed through was because I wanted to kind of do it so that I knew how it was for other people with the program that we were sponsoring here in the city. Mm -hmm. But it could put off people really easily. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how you actually kind of handhold. Do these energy coaches actually help people navigate those forms, the loan process, you know, what can we do to actually make this manageable for people? Because it's really complicated. That's really a question. Um, so it is very complicated. Have you done energy coaching in any capacity? Not so much. Okay. So the way the process works currently is that based on your interest, you either fill out a survey or give me a call. I'll do the pre-qualification, set you up with an appointment, and there is the income verification to the Mass CEC in order to make sure that you qualify for the incentives available. It takes about 10 minutes, and but you'd be surprised how many people don't do it. Um, we do offer energy coaches who will talk with you on the phone through the process. It's, it's like five or six pages, but for some people based on having separate filings in a, in a household or like two family homes and having to gather everybody's papers. Sometimes it is difficult, so we do have an energy coach. If, they, if it is necessary, walk people through that process. Um, but after that, we come down, to, I, I apologize, this is taking a little broader of a stroke than I guess you anticipated, but after we come out for the visit, um, Sunbug, a representative from them, will come with an energy specialist from CET and we'll take measurements of the house to see where the best optimal locations for the heat pumps would be, as well as take some information about the roof, uh, the sun eye percentage to see how much potential there is for solar. And then behind the scenes, the energy specialist who went to the site will be plugging in the old bills into this calculator, talking between the heat pump installer and the solar installer to see you know, the, the values of Okay, so you want two heads and one pump, or if you have a larger house, two pumps and maybe four heads, and running those calculations between the heat pump and solar, I'll just call it by the names, but Gerard and Sunbug, and they enter a conversation where Sunbug requires how many heat pumps are necessary in order to give their values, and then we come to the interested party having done all of that with several proposals that have numbers. So this is how much you would pay monthly if you went with this system, how many panels would be installed, how many heat pumps would be installed, and this is what the monthly payment would be, how much your savings would be, and give two or three of those proposals. Um, when a proposal is agreed upon, we'll actually 
drive to the person's house and uh, have a conversation with them there about signing contracts and getting things started with UMass 5. Um, deliver the check to the person when it comes from UMass 5 and work with them through the monthly payments. So we really do try as much as we can to do things in-house to just make it so that the person is completely understanding what they're receiving or what the possibilities are and then bring things to them to sign with full explanations of what they are. If they have any questions, they're more than welcome to call us and discuss any part of it. <laughs> I remember one person found a phrase that she didn't understand on like page 14 or something of one of the contracts and called us and was able to get through a discussion of what that meant. So. And I have not worked as an energy coach, but I've heard of things that you've done to help people. And uh, some people don't have Wi-Fi, and I know you've driven to people's houses to sign a contract with them and come back. So I, I think that. your team has done a good job of helping people where they're at to go through the program. A number of years ago, uh, the city worked with Columbia Gas and National mm -hmm. Grid to get a employee at CET mm -hmm. to be an energy coach for small businesses mm -hmm. because time and effort is small businesses' biggest obstacle to doing energy efficiency. It's to just you know to negotiate the whole mass save yeah. uh, program is time and effort, and that's that's a bigger obstacle than money. Um, and so you guys had someone on staff that was really successful. Um, you do good. Do you got her name? I'm sure she's got some tips for you. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. she did it well with the small business groups. I think that's the same thing you're trying to do here. It wouldn't be Cedar by any chance, would it? No, okay. I can't remember the name. Um, Megan? Megan. Do you know her name? No. Okay. No. I'll have to look it up. You get back to me, I, I can probably <laughs> figure it out. I think, I mean, I think that's a, a good point you're making about small businesses, and it translates to this mm -hmm. target population as well, because if you're talking about people that are 80% of the median income, it's probably you know a couple and they both work full time, yeah. and, and those are the hours during which a lot of this stuff needs to get done. Mm -hmm. And so there are just a lot of obstacles, and it's really important to you know I would really encourage you to to work with the first you know five ten households and see what those obstacles are so that moving forward you can make it less yeah. obstacle free because mm -hmm. it really it, it, it was extraordinary how much time I put into you know from scanning things yeah. and sending them and finding numbers and having to call the installer to get particular numbers and it, it's very labor and time intensive yeah and we we do realize that, and we the energy specialist has gone to visits after hours and 5.15 and 5.30 to accommodate for those people, but you are totally correct that basically every obstacle that could have happened, we've we've seen so far. And so you don't realize how many there are until you see them, but it's, uh, it's, it's a, all learn, always a learning process. All the systems that you're working with. Yeah. All well, the more reason to take Elisa's suggestion, use the first batch of Mm -hmm. projects as case studies and you know do process improvements and and then the successful ones use them as poster children for the follow-on ones to get people to be spokespeople for, for the next one mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense yeah great program sounds fantastic yeah just thinking that um <clears throat> If you uh, provide these flyers to the button up Northampton folks, they might find some people who fall within this income range who might be interested, or unless you're already doing them. So if we haven't, it's a great idea. Do you have a contact for the button up Northampton folks? I'm sure I can find it. If you're not, I'm sure you can talk it's to It's Marty Nathan. Yeah, I'm sure we can talk to Adele after. Okay, okay. okay. it'd be my pleasure. Yes, sir. A uh, quick question. What do you do with, I understand the coupling of the, uh, Heat pump for the solar. Mm -hmm. Work with the house, which there are a fair amount around here that have no roof area or very little to put up um, panels. Do you have ways you can hook them up with community solar or some other ways that they can do the solar piece, although they can't do their own panels on their own houses? Um, so we do have uh, an option for ground mounted solar. I understand that there may be some logistical issues with that as well, but um, Lynn from Co op Solar. Uh, she has a fantastic solar co-op program that uh, I would recommend people go to if this doesn't work out for one reason or the other. Um, and would, would speak to people about finding those co-op options and uh, 
the only one personally that I know of right now at this very moment is Co-op Solar, but do some more co-op research. Co-op Power? Co-op Power. Co-op Power. But that couldn't be joined with the airflow seat pumps. Our program requires the ownership of solar panels. Yes, you are correct. I'm um, sorry, we should say that again. Our program requires the ownership of solar panels, so the co-op yeah. power couldn't be joined with our air source seat pump. But, but not, they that could, were, not that they couldn't go Yeah, they could do it on their own, they just couldn't go through solar access. Yes, but right. having said that, we'd be able to like, give their information Refer to our them. partners yes. who would be able to assist them with the incentive process outside of this program. And I guess that's something good to add is that everyone that does come through our program gets referred to if their um, fuel assistance, they can go through ABCD out of Boston. Um, or if they're over income, they get referred to some bug and drive to talk about the options of just going through the regular rebates and the mm -hmm. are available um, through the state and federal. So everyone, we help everyone find their path even if they can't come through us. I mean, as it is really important to people to get renewable energy, I think more than ever these days. So providing the avenues through whatever means we can, I think is one of our priorities mm -hmm. as a company. Thank you very much. I think that's the, and if um, I would say if anybody has any further suggestions for outreach or anything, you send them my way. I'd be happy to pass them on to. Um, I think Adele is going to take over. And, and Adele might take over as well. <laughs> <laughs> we get up some flyers. Okay, um, wait. You've got the next three agenda items. All right. They're all they're all kind of lumped together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's got to so we talked briefly about the climate resiliency regeneration plan. This is just an early draft. This sort of our you know summary of the project is. Um, uh, you can see I mean, the most interesting part is really just organizationally. We're trying to look at everything in, in resiliency regeneration, but they just need some way to organize it. So you see in that second paragraph sort of the headings that we're hoping I'm looking at. We know that obviously you know, transportation and buildings are the, the big greenhouse gas emissions and we're asking them to look at it both from a use standpoint and a fuel source type. Um, and they're currently working on, on several fronts. Um, reorganizing our comprehensive plan, uh, following the SAR communities, which is a um, sustainability uh, formatting. Um, and too big to sort of say the dates, but on October 23rd and December 11th, we're gonna have our forums. So during the day, we're gonna have focus groups. This will be for cities, in, for the city, government, for institutions, you know, Smith College, et cetera, um, and for all the advocacy groups in town. Um, and then the evening, we're gonna have public forums. So I'm hoping you all come and you know show that on me on this so we're we invited well maybe not you once you move. <laughs> 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 what are you kicked off the mailing list? Yeah, when what you, you were referring to um, dates, I don't see that was on the sheet. No, it's not on the sheet. Okay. So, so the dates are October twenty third and December eleventh. December eleventh is gonna be at the senior center. October 23rd, the daytime meetings are going to be at City Hall, and we're still looking for a venue for the evening. Again, we're sending you formalized invitations once it gets closer to here. What is it called again? So, um, there's going to be the workshops for the climate resiliency and regeneration. Um, so, then the second thing I emailed you this, and this is, I actually have printed this ahead of time, so if you have the email, look at that version instead of this print version. So this is an earlier version, but we had an intern, I think it was a year ago or two years ago. 2017? 2017? You your last date on this is 2017, so. Okay. Um, who did a greenhouse gas inventory for us. Um, you know, obviously, we have lots of gaps in the data. We're not trying to pretend otherwise, but it's still the best data that's out there. Um, she wasn't necessarily a graphic person, so we just we asked as part of this process our consultants to take her data to massage it if they could at all, particularly about the uh, uh, transportation greenhouse gas emissions. Because the way you use transportation for us is estimates of vehicle miles traveled, and they are estimates, and then models of converting vehicle miles traveled to what do we expect in terms of fuel consumption. 
So obviously lots of steps, you know, until which could be wrong. Um, so what I just passed out is the inventory that they've done for us, taking her data, updating it a little bit, making it more readable. And then the more recent version I emailed you is, they did this by use, so buildings, transportation. We asked them to also break down by fuel type, and so that's what they've added to the version we just So pipeline needs is <laughs> Good point, okay. <laughs> um, we may not have data for it, but at least we should certainly use a... There's the, um, Senator Markey did a, a research study in Massachusetts, and it doesn't break it down, I think, by region, but um, you could probably figure out some proportion of what they identified from the state okay, of Massachusetts. Okay, that's right. From Western Massachusetts. Yeah, so I'm just talking about what you realize that part of this is to get your feedback. So I'm not, not just trying to do that. That kind of stuff is extremely useful. The reason we want to do it by fuel type is we're trying to to think about where the conversation is going to go in the plan itself. You know, and the reality for a lot of people is, yeah, it's all buildings, but how I'm dealing with my electric load is totally different from how I'm dealing with my thermal load. And obviously, it's the last conversation. I mean, you tried to bridge it in the last conversation about panels and heat pumps, but they're still sort of somewhat different. One is we add, one thing we have a gap on is we actually don't have a great base, right? So, so we've said because the, the global covenant of mayor says that we have a goal of 80 percent reduction by 2050, but we don't really have great data on where we're, where you know if we have data for 2016 or 2017, we're not sure where we'd be at. And Chris is data on city energy consumption, but not so much on community consumption. And in some ways, I'm beginning to think, well, you know, yeah, we can the global covenant happy because we made this commitment. What we really want isn't so much that 80% by 2050, but to um, plot it all the way down to zero. Uh, in that case, then the percent doesn't matter, it's just where we're going. And in some ways, the lack of data makes me more intrigued about just saying, how do we get to zero and what was happening? So what we hope the plan is going to be, you all know the term wedge diagram? You guys a little bit before. So you know, we want to look at, where are the places, where are all the places we, we created greenhouse gas emissions and what's the plan for getting to zero? Um, and we don't know what policies we're gonna implement 12 years from now. So it can't be incredibly fine grained, but we can begin to say, you know, Valley Bike, right? We think Valley Bike serves lots of purposes, making low income people more mobile, as giving transportation choices, but one of the things it does is deals with greenhouse gas. Right, we've had 50,000 miles driven on Valley Bike um, since uh, beginning of July. So in just two and a half months, we got 50,000 miles on. But I don't know, like, I have almost never used my bicycle since Valley Bike. So, so I don't really know this 50,000 miles, how many people, I, but I've also sold one of my cars. I don't know how many people no longer have a car or two cars, or how many people just put their own bike in the garage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get fine grained. Again, it's going to be a lot of guesswork in this process. But how much is going from 707 members for Valley Bike to 20,000 members? How much is that the secret? Or, you know, PBTA is doing these uh, electric buses and having lots of problems with them. You know, is that a, you know, So just trying to look at all those things so we don't waste our energy, no our fossil fuel energy, but. Our, our, our energies on dead ends aren't going to have a lot of effect. Um, so this, this is a work in progress. The, um, the resiliency plan is supposed to be done by February. Um, so a lot of work between now and then. That's really just a kickoff for our redoing sustainable work in. So we still get another crack at our consultant report that comes to us in February. Then we think about how do we bring it to work. Um, and then the last part of the sort of trilogy I want to talk about, and they're all related, is separate from the resiliency plan. I think, you know, we got this four hundred thousand dollar grant to do what we're calling the campus designs with nature to begin thinking about stormwater. So we know that stormwater is so so regeneration for us is sort of mitigation. We use the term regeneration instead of mitigation because it's more than just greenhouse gases. It's also dealing with invasive plants and, and other things. And, and but, but um, on the mitigation side, on the uh, uh, adaptation side, we're sort of using resiliency as being again broader than adaptation. Um, and we know that stormwater changes are probably one of the biggest issues we have to deal with on the resiliency side. Right? So we expect 
some more rainfall in Northampton as a result of climate change. Probably not so much that it's a, a significant factor for us, but we expect much bigger storms, and that's the bigger concern. So we go from, I think I got the numbers, 41 inches a year to 46 inches a year, not devastating. Maybe it's even good, but if we go from you know, the average uh, big 24-hour storm being two inches of rain to a big storm being four inches of rain, that means every time we get a storm, it's what we used to call a 100-year storm. Again, I'm not sure those numbers are the correct ones. And so to begin with that, we're doing the study. $400,000 does not go very far. This is we're looking at 10 sites in town, 10 potential opportunity sites, prioritizing, doing some community uh, outreach as part of the discussion about them, and then doing design for what are those 10 rise to the top. What are their opportunities for catching water? It is probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, if we we're going to replace all of our stormwater pipes. You know, I just oversaw a project to replace a stormwater pipe on Holyoke Street. We spent close to $2 million to replace 400 feet of pipe. Now, that is next to a railroad line. It is everything wrong you could imagine, and it's a six foot by six foot box smaller. So biggest stormwater line we have in town in the worst construction conditions we have in town. But nonetheless, this stuff was really expensive. You know, the city looked at the solution to the fairgrounds of putting a new pipe to the Connecticut River, ignoring when we were sending the water somewhere else, and it's $7 million for one pipe. It's a non-starter. Um, and so these were all, so all the 10 sites we're looking at are places where we might have opportunities for storing water on site before it goes. It's, we do want to get public input on this process as well, but we don't want to, I mean, the reality of our 10 sites is our selection is not based on who comes to public meetings. Because some sites just work from an engineering standpoint and some don't work from an engineering standpoint. The biggest reason we want public input, frankly, is there will be two reasons. One is, I don't think anybody in the city has big racism out there, but I do think that neighborhoods that know how to lobby the planning board and city council and DPW are more successful getting things than neighbors that don't. So we want to think about how do we equalize those kinds of things. How do we get the conversation so that River Run, for example, I always use an example for sidewalks. I don't think anyone ever made a decision that we're not going to give them sidewalks, but they don't come to meetings, they can get sidewalks in the process. What's the equivalent for that in this process? Um, and then obviously we want this from an education standpoint. And finally, the tying together of the, the stormwater project with the state of Northampton is, I don't think we can ever sell resiliency um, from just climate change alone. Right? So everybody in this room probably thinks it's a you know climate emergency. But a lot of the studies about what does it take to change people's patterns are they have to see something concrete in their lifetime. Um, and so sort of all the negative messages aren't necessarily that effective in changing, getting everybody involved. Um, stormwater is great because there's an incredible amount of co-benefits, whether it's more trees so we have less um, you know, heat, you know, heat island effect, or whether we restore, you know, we're looking at culverts that let amphibians move under our roads instead of being crushed on top of the roads. At the same time, they're, they're caring more. So we're, we're focusing a lot on those co-benefits. And the co-benefits are caring what we think it's Great opportunity to both educate and engage citizens. We're of course one hurricane away from a dramatic display of what you talk about. It's I think imagine people's attention would be riveted if. Um, yeah, I think it's true, and obviously, you know, we always talk about it's one pump failure or one dike right. failure to flood all of downtown. So I'm not saying that hurricanes aren't a huge risk and, and a certainly growing risk. But I still think those four inch storms happen twice a year right. on a day to day basis may be worse than that storm that happens when and both people see it. You can touch and feel if it happens twice a year, <coughs> the hurricane sort of changes. And again, I'm trying to minimize that. But well and I'm actually very grateful to hear about your thinking relative to uh, I mean the properties that are more at risk or in are, tend to be lower value properties, and as a result, also people who don't necessarily have the means of a, a, a voice in, in impact. And so I'm, I'm particularly grateful that that's part of your analysis and calculus. 
that that it's very hard to hear. Uh, and yeah, well, you know, it, it, <laughs> Hurricane Irene, if that if that had diverted by about a mile and a half, we would have a very glaring example about what what those impacts would be and how and basically how our stormwater management system sustains us in average rainstorms and average rainfalls, but something like that would prove to us just how vulnerable we really are. Well, one of the things that DBW is looking at is, we all know that we have a dike around downtown, and if that dike failed during a river flood, it would flood basically up to Louis's office. My office stays high and dry, but Louis's office stays <laughs> That's why Louis's there, and you're over there. It's, it's <laughs> um, and, and we also know that if we have a big inland storm in, in a smaller watershed, the water rushes downtown, and we pump it outside. Right. One of the DPW is trying to do is what's the chance that both those events happen at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So we have sort of two risk events downtown. If they, you know, if the rivers come up, you know, there's a hurricane in Vermont, it makes the Kennebec River rise. I mean, yeah. if there's a hurricane in Northampton, it makes the Mill River rise, and therefore the pumps have to rise. Exactly. But it doesn't necessarily have a huge impact on the Kennebec River. So what's the chance that, and I'm not involved in that effort, but I know is looking at it very serious. Are, are, are levees and dikes? Are the exact same built at the exact same time as the ones around Lake Pontchartrain. So <laughs> by the same group of people, the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's cold comfort. Yeah, it's not, they, they, they were improved recently. <laughs> they're improved be, because it was mandated after Katrina. But it's also the fact that our pumps, our water pumps, our PT yeah. engines that were built in the Second World War, they don't even manufacture parts for those. We have a machine. <laughs> so we really, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, with duct tape and uh, and hopes and prayers, that's pretty much and, it. And we've done some things above the minimum standards, and we just got beaten up a little bit by uh, the state agency that works with FEMA, because Massachusetts is a statewide building code, and we can't do things in our zoning that the statewide building code does, and so one of their comments was, you're trying to do stuff in your zoning that should be in the building code, um, which limits our ability to be even stricter in, in some areas, is that free board. So, you know, we need to work on all of those different scales. Right, so that, that's my pitch, but I love, you know, besides pipeline leaks, I love any comments and any of these things for us to figure out. Is this going to be part of the, um, I mean, is this drafted kind of standalone on its own, or is it going to be part of the? Standalone during the public process, and then some form or other be brought into the plan. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one comment I have on here is that um, I would love to have a lot of the terms defined. Yep. Um, okay, good. Yeah. But, you know, is, um, for, for instance, uh, residential buildings, uh, does that include five units and above on uh, multi-family, or is that yeah. commercial? Yeah, okay. Et cetera, yeah. And then, um, you often refer to the original greenhouse gas inventory, which I, I think that's because this is kind of built on top of that, from what you said, but as soon as I heard that, when I looked at the spreadsheet, it was like, oh, the original greenhouse gas, but then all information stops. <laughs> it's like, you need to yeah. kind of blend the two. Let me see if we have to. I mean, you know, Kim Lundgren, who is the consultant who's doing this, she actually was at Ickley when we did the original piece, and so she knows how so, good and how bad it is. So do you, so that's what you mean by the original? The old 2011 one? Yeah. Yeah, is it 2011? That was? That was, yeah, I think that was, no, no, not 2011, 2001. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, so that's the one you're talking about. I think so. Yeah. I mean, she's not right. this. I can check to make sure it's really good. And you haven't updated it? Or is she referring to Marissa's work from the last summer? No, this is, this, what's here is, is oh, I'm not sure the answer, I guess it's really what she meant. It might be what she was referring okay. to. I was hoping so. I'd like both. That was, that was my question, was it, is it Marissa's work from last summer, or is it from 2001? In which case, I think it should be redone. <laughs> right, right, no, that, this, this is from Marissa's work, but um, we'd like it some comparison, it's not in here. Yeah. So, okay, right. I'll make sure we clarify that. Those are my comments. Yeah, okay, thank you. Anything else? If not, move on. I've lost my agenda. <laughs> Here it is. Um, okay, Nesk Facebook. Um, I just want to uh, mention that Aiden has been maintaining the Nesk Facebook ever since he was on the um, commission. And uh, he has got contacted me and said he would like to have someone else more involved with the commission take over. Um, so, <laughs> oh, uh, <yeah. laughs> 
We're all looking away. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, totally. I mean, oh, Facebook is so 2015. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought Aiden was maybe coming back to the commission. You know, you know, he's interested in it, and there is an opening now. <laughs> But I can't say I that. I really wanted to maintain the Facebook page, too. Scott, yeah. Scott you still yeah. could. Yeah. You can still do that. If you want to keep your hand in this, I think there's a okay. And I think it's a specific exception that people who live in a different towns. And if there's not, you'll make one. <laughs> so don't we need a digital native for this? And don't we have interns in your offices that can be? Don't have the interns in my role? office. I mean, I don't think the city has any kind of uh, general communications person. Um, Wayne, I don't know what, what, what planning does for that. We don't, I mean, it's actually, it's funny because we, we did a retreat a few months ago. This doesn't help you guys. We did a retreat a few months ago and sort of thought of what the gaps were. And we decided that our next hire is going to have to have, is going to be a social media person. And then unfortunately, some of this, you can see right there, some of this less my staff. And so we're looking for some of this outdoor stuff and the social media because. I'm not sure it helps this committee. I will go ahead and put my, my wish list out there. I think the city needs a so I think the city needs communications social media person for all departments that any department can kind of tap into. But and just be careful that wish because colleagues <laughs> trying to work in cities that have that, you have very little control of the messaging. Oh. Um, the messaging touch it. And right now the web page is essentially managed out of the mayor's office. But it might be a little more vague than what you were hoping for, but you know, you'd see a balloon or a kitten talking about save energy, and that'd be about it. You know, that no, it works well about it in there. I have communication with Lloyd. Okay, well. Don't post things with him. Yeah, no, no, I don't know what I'm saying, but I think to But it's the social media that goes beyond just a web page. Yeah, but I think what you want is a dedicated person to your, an intern. I think I would ask for an intern who would actually do so, so you say we want to transmit this message, turn it into a meme or something, post it, you know, throw it, throw it on Instagram, Snapchat, the hell out of it, you know, you can kind of. You're over my head. <laughs> See, there's the rub. There's the rub. And by the way, I'm talking about antique systems there, Chris. I wasn't even talking about the newer platforms. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only joking. joking. <laughs> So um, I guess I'll put it out there, um, and it's a, you know, or maybe it's a notice that the Facebook page may kind of stop being maintained if someone doesn't um, step forward. We don't have to have a Facebook page. The Energy Commission doesn't, but. Um, so I'll put it out there. If anybody wants to take over, reach out to me, or if you know someone who might, or maybe Bill, maybe we'll take your I'll idea. I'll you. talk to some youth commissioners and see if they <laughs> might be interested in interning in that. The, I mean, point of fact is the cohort that uses Facebook are the people we're trying to reach. Right. Uh, you know, 15 years ago they would have been 14, and that obviously not who we're trying to reach. But now, now it's grizzled people like ourselves who are now Facebook <laughs> cohort, and, and we're still checking on see what someone ate today. So, <laughs> so then, in the meantime, if, you, if um, Aiden wants to make me a manager of that, I'm happy to hold that. And I can also put things up occasionally as they come my way or outcomes in meetings or new information about uh, CBT or whatever. So I can do it, you know, just kind of as a band aid in the meantime. But I think the Youth Commission idea is stellar. Yeah. Okay. And we've actually it. talked about having some more kind of cross fertilization of yep. this commission and this commission, so yep. that would be one way to do that. Okay, great. For both of those. Okay, wonderful. Um, last uh, item, um, I think everybody's kind of had a chance to see it because I did uh, email it out. Um, but Alyssa, you had asked for a report on how the landfill, the PBRA on the landfill is going. So just to kind of um, sum it up real quickly for everybody to hear. Uh, so production from October, when it went online, it was very end of October, um, to July. And I'm going to July because that's the, um, uh, that's the, the bill where we've had our, our net metering credit um, bill from Amoresco for, so I can't, I can't go beyond that. Anyhow, um, it has produced uh, um, 2,452,647 kilowatt hours of electricity 
uh, or basically 2.4 megawatt hours of electricity. Um, uh, that offsets 846 metric tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. That's equivalent to, I say, a little over 900,000 pounds of coal burned. It's enough electricity to run 76 Massachusetts homes for a year, just the electricity. Enough energy to drive an average car over 2 million miles. So that's what we produced in, in nine months. The value of those net metering credits, so the kilowatt hours get generated, it goes on to a bill, which basically spins the meter backwards because there's no use on site. The uh, national grid gives that a, a monetary value. Those values uh, then get assigned to our bills, to a large array of our bills. Um, uh, so far in those nine months, it's generated $459,318 of value has been assigned to all of our bills. And we have to pay MRS for those. We don't get them all completely uh, clean. We have paid um, $245,823 for that, leaving us with a savings of $213,495, or about a 46% reduction um, in our energy costs because of the landfill. Um, uh, that basically sums it up. How does it compare to expectations? Yeah, it's about right, right in line with expectations. Um, and because we have a, with AMRS, we have a set price um, uh, per kilowatt hour for the, uh, what we pay for it. As electricity prices go up, our savings will increase mm. because we're paying a set price. If electricity prices suddenly plummeted, we would lose out. <laughs> but it's more likely that electricity prices are going to Because part of the reason I asked about this was mm -hmm. because um, in the current years, the, the new fiscal year's um, budget, more money was um, allocated for energy purposes than in past years. And it didn't make sense to me because we've had nine months of the solar array giving us income. Right. So I, I was just trying to kind of reconcile why, in fact, that number was higher in the mayor's budget. Yep. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that specifically, and especially with the, um, the replacement of the, the, the new LED lights that were put in. We were supposed to have a savings of those as well. Right. So let me, let me try to do that. Um, number one, I don't think the LED lights, the savings from the LED lights will work into the calculation. Uh, so that will be seen in the next budget. Um, uh, I don't believe that. But as far as this goes, um, uh, at the same time, we went for new energy supply, and so our cost for electricity changed, and I believe went up a little bit. Particularly, there there are portions of the um, of the of this of the electric the electric bills are kind of complicated. They have demand and demand peak charges and stuff like that. So the report so the so the basic cost of electricity changed and went up. I think went up a little bit. Um, but because this was a new program, and everybody felt kind of, hmm, how exactly is this going to work? It's supposed to work great. Let's not get ourselves in trouble. They didn't incorporate the full savings expected in their budget projections. So hopefully, by the end of the year, you're going to see us coming in on the budget. That's what I believe is going to happen. Yeah. It's important to emphasize that when that time comes, because we have to, in fact, make a case for the fact that we have Right. You know, put the solar array in place, and you know what? What are the you benefits of it for right. the city? Right, right, yeah. I think to Elisa's point, the uh, of the two politicos here, we have to. We're making a case with constituency, and actually, it'd be great to have a holistic assessment of um, segment of time of savings realized and offsets realized. It, 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 it's something that's easily digestible. It's a, it, it's a number that we can transmit when we're talking to constituents. Will this it, work at the moment for nine months? This will hold for now for the, <laughs> for the yeah, exactly. Yes, this will help. Right. And uh, but it, and it does come up. I mean, obviously, these things don't necessarily jive when, when we have to make a presentation or or have hearings relevant to the budget. It does. Uh, there's four people watching on community access when we when we ask these deep probative questions. Uh, but I, at least the point is, is, is a good one because uh, we, and this actually speaks to Wayne's point too, if we want to reinforce, if we want people to understand the value of what we're doing as opposed to just pie in the sky kind of hippie stuff that uh, is just all feel good stuff. No, there's, there's genuine 
value to you regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. There are there is a return here, right. and it's not only a reduced our, our reduced contribution to decimating the climate to uh, also the fact that there's genuine real savings and benefit that it's it's more robust than what we've been dealing with today. So, well, so it's a way for the city to model for people with their you know yeah. their private right. sector that they can do the same thing and have the same kind of benefits. Mm -hmm. So so towards that, I'll give you one more anecdote. And I've heard this both from DPW and essential service folks. Uh, at the moment, the electric bills that are coming in, they're coming in at zero. They're well, coming in a bill, zero dollars. That's so that's the kind of money. digestible number. Yeah. Right. 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 That is that is what we're we well yeah. yeah. we we built up enough debt bigger credits that we're actually built, we're paying we're paying very few bills, and the bills we are paying are very small. Okay. It's equivalent with my uh, my council check. Yeah. So that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. Second. Aye.